friend and welcome to another episode of Chapters of Longstrong Television. Chapters is a show that lets us hear from authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky, and sometimes even farther around. I'm your host, Carter Seaton, and it's great to have you with us. Today, our host, our guest, excuse me, today our guest is Haley Lee Hughes. Haley is an essayist and poet. She holds a BA in creative writing from Marshall University. She served as a J. William Fulbright U.S. student grantee in 2018-19 in Cork Island. She received her MA in creative writing from the University College in Cork in 2020. Her work has appeared in Etc., which is Marshall's literary magazine, The Rose Ro Rooster, and The Quarrymen. She has contributed personal essays to The Mighty, an online platform for people who have disabilities and caregivers of people with disabilities. Her first chapbook, The Cane in the Cupboard, was recently published by Summer Camp Publishing, and she lives in Parkersburg, West Virginia. We're delighted to have you, Haley. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled. This is great. Your book is fascinating, and it's a very personal look at your own life, and in many places, that of your three siblings. Um, tell us a little bit about the background of why you decided to write that and what you hope to convey in writing about being a quadruplet, which is a story enough, <laughs> and also being um, having some disability as a result of that quadruple birth. Um, I think I, I set out to write this specifically because um, when often when we talk about multiple births, um, uh, it's, it's in the framing of a TLC reality show. And it's not, to me, it really doesn't capture the reality of the difficulties or the mundanities of daily life. And, um, and for me personally, I, I realized in college when I started writing seriously that um, often I would write about themes of grief and um, disability and anger. Um, and I, I didn't really touch on my birth or uh, living with my siblings. Um, until I, I started my senior year at Marshall University. And it was one of those things where um, I felt like I was, like I was writing on these themes, but I wasn't really touching on what I needed to write about. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, I had a lot of um, pent up resentment and anger and, um, this makes it sound all very negative. Um, and so I, I felt like I needed to kind of write to, to, to express what I was thinking in my mind. And that's what being an essay is, essayist is, is thinking on the page and, and kind of exploring those feelings. And I realized once I wrote about um, the difficulties that I could reflect on, um, the the kind of mundanities and and funny things of, of being a multiple and i i didn't write about this in the book but like you know there are three um, girls in my family and we would often share outfits and um we would go to girl scout events and and get the same t-shirts and sometimes my sister and I, our, our bedrooms when we were teenagers were um, parallel to each other um, with a wall between them. And we would step out of our rooms and <laughs> I'd look at her and she'd look at me and I'd be like, go change. I don't want to wear the same shirt as you. And she'd be like, no, you go change. And <laughs> um, just... You know, so I, you know, I realized that um, I, I guess the, the main reason why I wanted to write this is to kind of give a balanced 
view of, of the difficulties of growing up with a disability um, because we live in this moment. Um, I, I, I think it's actually a, a very progressive moment of um, people with disabilities um, being uh, given a platform. And, um, and so I kind of wanted to counter that narrative of like a person with a disability as an inspiration um, uh, with um, the lived reality of someone with a disability who has a unique experience but has positive and negative feelings about it. Um, I think that's that one of the things that, that were, was inspirational about the book is that there that you did also touch on the, the positives, the blessings um, of your life. And I think that's a, that is something that we rarely see when we talk about a story of someone with a disability. Um, did this feel cathartic once you'd written it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I definitely it felt cathartic because there were there were um, things that I had spoken about um, just with my family that I'd never um, written about or spoken about publicly. And um, like I touch on some of the moments in which I was bullied in school. And I know um, a lot of people are bullied, but I think it's very different when you are bullied specifically for the body you inhabit. Um, and it caused a great deal of insecurity. And I remember um, talking to my mom and, and I mean, this was years after, you know, when I was an adult and saying, you know, I really wish I could have an apology. You know, that's all I wanted. And, and you know, she was just, she just said, you know, I, you may or may not get it, but, um, you kind of have to move forward from it regardless. And it, it felt good to write about it because I, I it, in a cliche way, it felt like I wasn't giving the bully or the bully's power anymore over, over my life. Like I had been telling this story for years and um, writing about it privately, but once I, put it out there and, and named the person. Um, it, it felt like I was kind of, by telling it in my way, I was kind of reclaiming that experience, which probably sounds a little cliche, but it was- No, it wasn't at all. I think that's, um, <laughs> that's, that's the good antidote to it, is that you, know, you, you took over rather than letting them run your life. Yeah, and I, there were moments when I was crafting the book and and I want to be clear that um, as writers we pick and choose what we write about and like this this is a snippet of my life this is a portrait of my life but it's not my whole life and um, I and I told many of my friends because I only uh, feature a few of them here, but I told many of my friends, I said, please don't be offended. You're not in the book, but you're very important to me. Um, but when I was choosing those very vulnerable moments to, to write about, um, there had been one incident um, in, in junior high that I'd written about numerous, written about numerous times in my workshop classes and I thought about placing it in the book and I said you know what I've I've written about this enough times um, and I'm tired of choosing to let them shape my narrative um, and so I think that's important too um, when we talk about the construction of books and catharticism is you know sometimes there's power in what you don't write, mm -hmm. um, in in choosing not to let those people have a have a center stage presence, you know. Yeah. So, in the first chapter, you talked a little bit about <clears throat> how having some physical dif disability um, 
made you become a writer in a sense. Do you think if you had been different, you would not have become a writer? Um, I mean, that that's so hard to say because I am, I mean, aside, I, I, outside of my disability, I think I'm, a, I'm just a natural bookworm. Like when I was a child, um, and we had writing assignments. I mean, I wrote a lot of fiction, like like goofy stories, like the adventures of Super Pickle <laughs> about a like about a cucumber who wears like a cape and rescues the food in the kitchen. Um, and so, I mean, even before I was writing personal um, essays and stories, I was writing a lot of goofy fiction, which reflected on what I was reading. Um, so I can't really say um, if I would have been, a, if I wouldn't have been a writer had I not had um, cerebral palsy, because I, I think in some ways, maybe I wouldn't have had the courage to, to write about myself, because when I was in college, um, I had a professor, um, Dr. Rachel Peckham, who mm. I, I, yeah, she's wonderful. Hi, Rachel. Um, <laughs> um, and she, she was really the, the first teacher I had to say, like, you know, you should write about this, like your story is, is not only, um, is not only intimate and personal, but it's doing the work of of an essayist and uh, of an essay and um you know I I think like if I hadn't had a professor or um someone moving me in that direction I don't know if I would have started writing about myself personally um so I, I don't know it, it's so hard to say I I think I Perhaps if I didn't have a disability and I touch on this, um, I, I think I would have been a dancer or, mm -hmm. um, and I was really into the arts in high school. Like I probably would have tried to pursue um, acting more. Um, so I don't know, it's such a difficult question because um, the, the brain is, is such an integral part of who we are and, um, I, I, and I've, I've looked at it this way, like I think about Play-Doh and how if you take a ball of Play-Doh and you mold it and then you stick little pieces on top of it, you still have the ball. It's still that, that core part of the design. You just have added little pieces to it. And I kind of think about that um, when I think about oh, well, if I had a neurotypical brain, that's what it would be like. It would be like God um, <laughs> pasting little pieces <laughs> of Play-Doh to my brain. Not that that's a great <laughs> metaphor, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think being a writer is a core part of who I am, so. <laughs> uh, you've got a quote in here that I really love. It says, so to live happily, not in spite of my disability, but in spite of the social stigma of it is a radical act. And I think you, um, you embody that. You, your, um, your career, your education, the way that you took the bull by the horns and went to Ireland um, on your own, um, becoming a Fulbright scholar, that's, that's things that anybody would aspire to, getting your degree in Ireland. How did all that come about? Um, so I had never really envisioned myself um, traveling. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd always wanted to visit other countries, but it was one of those ideas you have that is kind of in the in the ephemeral where it's like, oh, I, I could jump out of a plane one day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think um, as I got to my, um, to the end of my undergraduate career, I knew I wanted to be a, a professor and a writer, and I was searching for ways to make that happen. 
and um, I I had the grades and I, you know, and I'd, I'd published a little bit in my undergraduate um, um, career and I, um, the scholarship advisor at Marshall had taught um, English in the English department and um, I was directed toward her and she said, you know, you could apply for the Fulbright program. They, um, you know, they don't just take people from Yale and Harvard because that was my main concern. It's like, oh, I go to this state school in Appalachia. Um, and um, not that I was like ashamed of that at, at all, like absolutely not, but I just, I knew that, you know, I, I, or I thought that those programs really valued Ivy League educations. Um, and so it, it was kind of interesting because she, she said, well, wh where would you want to go? And I just, I thought Ireland, like I've always wanted to go there. And um, so it, it's one of those scholarships in which they don't they don't want to hear a sob story like like in the way that like high school scholarships where it's like tell me about a time you've persevered they want like okay like you know if we give you this opportunity how are you going to bridge two cultures um and that's kind of the the um the purpose of those um, of the Fulbright program is to promote um, mutual understanding and peace between cultures. And um, so I, um, I realized that, oh, like I could, you know, like so much of Ireland is, um, or Irish culture is about storytelling, storytelling and the preserving of um, a culture that was, um, colonized and usurped from them. And I started thinking about the way in which the disabled body is um, often um, co-opted by other people for um, other purposes. And I, so I applied the first time and it was a very kind of um, <laughs> idealistic, um, type of application where I talked about colonization and like storytelling and um, and I didn't make it I, I didn't get it and I I realized that I you know that there was so much about Irish culture that I didn't understand that that history is not my history mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that it's much more nuanced um, and so I applied a second time um, and my I had just finished my capstone in which I talked about volunteering um, as a hospice volunteer. And um, I, that was a very difficult period for me personally. Um, and I applied again and I kind of focused on like, I, I you know, I, I know nothing of Irish culture. Like I just want to learn and being, being open to that. Um, and, and cultivating my craft too. And I knew I could learn so much from, mm -hmm. um, I mean, from like the country that brought us Seamus Heaney. <laughs> um, so I guess that, that's what. There's so I'm much, sorry. Mike, so much of, of Ireland and uh, in Appalachia that there's a real commonality there too and I'm sure you learned that while you were there. Oh yeah and I, I kind of focused on that um, when I was applying for it and I, I definitely saw those commonalities like just in the music and the dance. Um, I One of my favorite memories is I was in the basement of this building it, and it was culture night and they had um, a group of step dancers and um, from the from the university and um, the electricity went out 
and we all got our flashlights and our phones and we shined them on the um, dancers and they danced for us until the uh, the equivalent of a of an American fire marshal came and said, "What are you doing here? Get out!" <laughs> um, but it, you know, like those um, those types of commonalities were um, rich in in my ability to make connections with people. Like I I would say, oh, like um, um, for example, like at Halloween, like. I talked about like the ghost stories we would tell and Halloween is, is significant in Ireland because it originated there. And um, so, I, I mean, just like my relationships were all built on storytelling and writing and reading poetry. And it, it was a truly wonderful experience. Title from your, of your book, The Cane in the Cupboard only appears um, the, the relevance of it only appears once you're in Ireland because you take this cane and then you put it in the cupboard and you don't, you, you try your best, you know, not to pull it out and not to use it. Um, yeah. So what was it about being there that gave you more confidence in yourself and in your abilities that maybe you didn't have back home? Um, <laughs> I think it was just the idea of that, that I could, uh, I'm sorry. Being independent? Yeah, well, it was the idea of being kind of a blank slate. Mm -hmm. Like um, I could, I, I could be someone else and I could, um, you know, all of these people didn't know my story and didn't make assumptions about me beyond what they could see. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for me, it was like, okay, if I use this cane, then, you know, they'll start, like, in some ways, I talk about this, it's nice to have, like, a signifier, then, then, you know, like, people do make assumptions about you, but they, they say, oh, like, she's like that because she has a cane, or because she's in a wheelchair, um, and in other ways, um, it was like, oh, but what if, what if it does the exact opposite where it's like, you know, the assumptions are that I, that I would just need to take the elevator instead of the stairs. And so I, part of my, um, part of my he hesitancy and the ability to be more confident was just the idea that like, well, maybe I could control this myself. And which ultimately is a very arrogant position um, because it, it, it doesn't allow for people to help you. Mm -hmm. And there were times when I really needed help and I didn't feel comfortable enough to ask for help because I was afraid that meant that I was somehow not independent, that I was somehow weak. And, and I think like the idea of going and living abroad and traveling to other countries. I was like, oh, I've made it. I'm at the pinnacle of independence. <laughs> and, um, but that wasn't necessarily true. Like I, my friends were very helpful and even strangers. Um, and I think that's what allowed me to say, well, I don't really need this. And even if I fall or if I do, um, injure myself like there are people around who would who would come to my aid I there's a really funny story um and I didn't write about this in the book but I have a very heightened startle reflex um I I mean if people drop a book on the floor or slam a door I'm just you know I'll jump out of my skin <laughs> and I was walking down the sidewalk in Cork and um, headed to town to go grocery shopping. And this, and it, if you've ever been in Ireland or read about Ireland, it rains about 80% of the time. And, um, and I was always um, cocky and saying, oh, I won't take my umbrella, it won't rain. <laughs> and it did. But I, so I thought I'll get, I'll get to the grocery store and come back. And this lady, 
um, past me and she opened her umbrella and the sound of the umbrella opening scared me so much that I fell into the grass. Oh, um, I just fell over. She said, oh dear, I gave you a fright. And I said, yes, you did, but we laughed about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and I think that that's one of the things I take joy in. Um, and I want to express like, there is so much joy in, in this life um, is like just the, the goofy things that my body will do that I can't control but cause other people to laugh yeah. um, and that was that was one of them <laughs> and um, about your writing life did you um, do you always is, is it mostly essays and poetry I know you're a poet which do you prefer um essays because yeah. I often I will write a, a poem and I think oh well, this should be an essay mm -hmm. um, and often um, um, I prefer writing poetry when I'm in a, a, a workshop environment when I'm with other people because um, so much of poetry at least for me is um, generated by other other writers um, um, input and in work um, if I can if I can start a poem with uh, with an image a driving image or with tension um, then I then I feel comfortable um, continuing and so much of that feedback comes from other people mm -hmm. um, do you and, ever write fiction? Oh man, I it's one of this it's one of the, I, I'm sorry. I said you want to go back to writing the story of the superhero pickle. <laughs> <laughs> um when you when you pursue a degree in creative writing, um you have to take um workshops in the genre that you're not comfortable with. And originally when I was an undergraduate, I wasn't comfortable with poetry, but um, I took fiction classes and I really struggled with um, dialogue. Um, my dialogue was very stilted. Um, and I was 19 and so I was reading a lot of um, uh, young adult literature. So a lot of my fiction uh, featured like teenagers, mm -hmm. um, you know, in very dramatic situations. And <laughs> my professor would just look at them like, oh, <laughs> and um, not, not that he wasn't encouraging, but like um, my fiction professor was the one who um, pushed me to read more widely. Um, and so as I read more widely, um, I felt more comfortable in crafting dialogue. I realized how to construct um, um, characters. And I think like the, the weakness in my fiction um, is or was, I haven't, um, shamefully, I haven't tried seriously writing fiction um, since I was an undergraduate, but um, maybe I'd feel more comfortable now. Um, so what's your next I, project about? Um, I would love, yeah, I would love to write a full length memoir and incorporate um, poetry as um, section dividers, if that makes sense. Um, because I had so much trouble with the structure of this book um, and that in the the thread in which um, to, so that each essay would fall together because even though they're independent, they're part of a book. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would, I, I'm not currently writing it, but I would love to, to write a full length memoir and, and, and include some poems. <laughs> we hope you do. Thank you. Uh, I, I highly recommend your debut book. It really is inspirational. How can our viewers get The Cane in the Cupboard? Uh, so 
they can purchase it through Amazon. Okay. Um, there is a Kindle ebook version and there's obviously the hard copy um, version, which I have right here. Um, or they can order it directly through my publisher. Thank you so much for being with us. It's all the time we've got today and it's been such a pleasure to talk with Haley Hughes and have all of you all with us. Thanks to Armstrong Television for presenting chapters on their channel and uh, eventually on YouTube. We hope to return to live interviews soon, but in the meantime, please stay well and join us for our next episode. Thank you again, Haley. It's been a pleasure. I'm Carter Seaton stay, saying stay tuned, stay well, and uh, keep watching this station for the news and views that impact you and your community. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Connect with Chapters through email. Write to lp4 at zoominternet.net. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, share, and comment. All Chapters episodes are available on YouTube. Visit the Armstrong Neighborhood channel on YouTube and look for a playlist of all the Chapters programs.